Hey, I'm Chip McGee, and i um, glad to bring to you Awaiting the King from James K. Smith. Uh, this is chapter one. Um, this is a few days before I write my paper, not fully done with the evaluation, so um, this is kind of more of a, a summary, a summary of what I found to be a difficult read. I've read uh, two of uh, his books previously, so I was excited to dig in and got into it, and it was pretty difficult reading. It was hard to hard to process. It took me a long time to process, so I'll do my best. Um, but just to begin, it kind of kicks off the chapter, and then I'm going to work from the back, um, just to kind of feel like it makes a little bit more sense of things. So he says that we tend to spatialize political theology, carving out church and state as two realms. So we spend our lives navigating the complexities of dual citizenship uh, between these two jurisdictions with invisible borderlines. So what he has to say is that the earthly city versus the city of God that St. Augustine speaks of is that the earthly city is far less of a place as much as it is a way of life. So he says, stop asking where um, the city of God is and the earthly city is, but instead ask how. Um, so to kind of summarize, towards the end of the chapter, he speaks more about the two cities. Um, and, uh, and he says that with, uh, with the relation between the city of God and the earthly city, it does not entail a withdrawal or an isolation from the common task of political life. Um, but he gives a, St. Augustine gives a, a stinging critique of imperial virtue that calls into question the extent or posture of the Christian community's participation in common political tasks. So, um, so I believe what he's saying there is um, this imperial virtue is to kind of uh, segregate, to, to pull out the Christian voice out of the public sphere as not their job. Um, so St. Augustine is actually concerned about the formation that takes place if the Christian community is too friendly about its involvement in the political practices of the earthly city. So, um, so the difference in the two cities is this, it's marked by the standards by which they live. So the earthly city is by the standards of the flesh, whereas the earth, where the city of God lives by the spirit. Um, and he distinguishes them by their virtues and their vices. Um, most prominently, uh, as you'll see throughout the read, is their loves, um, their desires, their, uh, their allegiances. He says that the earthly city established... But is established by self-love with contempt for God, but the heavenly city is established by the love of God and is even carried as far as a contempt for the self. So the city of God is in opposition with the, early, the earthly city because they have different loves. Um, and, and so it is, it makes a stark contrast that an individual member is a member of only one city. Uh, that there is not, there is not a possibility for a blend of both. So the earthly city is um, aligned with the fall and not with original creation, and the earthly city originates with sin. Um, it doesn't only mean the temporal space. Um, I thought this was a key point. On um, page forty-seven, he says the city of God is not just otherworldly. It is that a society of people who are called to embody a foretaste of the social and cultural life that God desires for this world. So you can see that um, that key point that we are to be involved in this world. So we recognize that earthly cultural systems are fundamentally disordered and they they're in need of both resistance and reordering. Those are two words I took on uh, from this reading is that, that our work is to be one of both resistance and reordering by Christian labor in all streams of culture. So we're, so we're called to seek the welfare of the earthly city because we're called to cultivate creation. So there's a creation mandate that we still carry. Um, so we do want to annex it into the city of God, which means we... Remember, not spatially, so this is not like a war, um, but uh, to annex to the city of God to reorder creaturely life into shalom. 
Um, so, um, so we recognize the love that animates the earthly city is misordered and misdirected by, by creatures who are creatures of love, who order their loves as if they are the creator. Um, and so there's a, a sense of um, kind of reshaping how we often view the duality of earthly city and the city of God. Um, one other key argument that I'll hit on um, in our time together is that um, there's this wrestling match in uh, the political sphere of what is ultimate, what is supernatural, what is eternal, and then also what he calls penultimate, which I had to look that word up, uh, which is natural or temporal. Um, and also in that, he later ties it to um, some public pluralism. So like directional pluralism, which is a pluralism of worldviews, of religions, of moral visions that, that feed and fund political, the political sphere. So that's more of like the ultimate that informs the way we interact in the world. But they also, <clears throat> as like a subset, he has associational pluralism, uh, which is a pluralism of institutions, of modes of human interaction, who you are, who you associate with in every facet of human life as a citizen, consumer, father, uh, your work, vocation, as a child of God. And then also, secondly, uh, contextual pluralism, uh, which is all the wide array of cultural differences. Um, and so we recognize cultural diversity as a gift and we affirm it as a plurality in which God actually delights. So in the Christian sphere, we lament the presence of directional pluralism of what is ultimate. Um, but there's a sense of we can... Um, we can go a particular we can go a particular length with people uh, within the context of associational and contextual pluralism. Um, so so we can partner on what is penultimate, so what is natural and what's temporary, um, as we wait for the Lord's coming. The danger of what he calls liberal um, pluralism is that live and let live is a directional vision. Um, it is an ultimate vision um, that is imposed upon society itself in the name of not imposing things on society itself. Um, so if you have that, then the question is left open. Who will decide the directional perspective that will integrate the vision for the society? Um, so a live and let live um, leaves open who is actually going to um, integrate the vision that informs the way in which we uh, guide society. So um, he proposes that even if you're a naturalistic atheist, uh, you confirm, I'm sorry, you confess something as ultimate. Uh, you'll be committed to some macro vision of what is good and what is just, and what is right. Uh, and if we're naturalistic atheists, it can tend to be um, a very self-centered and self-affirming worldview. Um, <clears throat> there's a quote in page 22 where it says, Lady liberalism purrs, I don't have any specific vision of the good to purvey. I'm not telling you what to believe. I don't really believe anything. Let's just agree to fix some rules to help us arrive at some consensus about penultimate matters. Um, so fixating on the ultimate, Lady Liberalism will say, is harmful, whereas fixating on the penultimate never hurts anyone. And he, in his, um, this is one of the lasting things I'll take from this chapter is that he says, you just cannot stay here because the political is not content to remain penultimate. And we are most prone to absolutize the temporal when our ultimate conviction is that there is no eternal. I think that's just been absolutely abundant in this past year in which we've, um, in which we've uh, survived uh, in 2020. Um, that, uh, that 
the the sphere of politics, um, even though it's focusing on penultimate matters, temporal matters, is not content because it is so shaped by our love and, in fact, um, demands our allegiance. He gave a vision of St. Paul walking down Washington Mall with his icons and his temples, and he says he would conclude the same thing he did at Mars Hill. I perceive that in every way you are very religious because your attachments become your temple, what you worship, and what we give ourselves to is what we invest our faith in, and that true justice requires true Christian worship, worship. Um, and that we are to be involved, we are to be involved um, in the life and the welfare of the city, ordering it to the shalom, the vision of creation that's been given to us. Um, and I'll close with this from page 31. Our ultimate visions are not agnostic about the penultimate. Uh, the ultimacy of the biblical eschatological vision is not just a prescription for a distant eternity, is also the norm for what is good culture making and what it looks like now in a fallen but redeemed creation. So the ultimate is not sequestered to kingdom come. It's the beacon for our own cultural renewal in the penultimate present. That means our eschatology impinges upon our politics. That is a necessity because the vision and the loves and the formation, Christian discipleship itself, uh, depends on it. Appreciate you guys listening.